it was right when I got in a fight with that dude about the remodel. And anger and depression are both on the same sides of the scale. It's just how much energy is being put into it. And after a big blow up like that, when the adrenaline wears off, if you're prone to depression, then it's really easy to slip off into it after that. And I watched Joe Rogan talking to Jelly Roll about dealing with criticisms from the press and whatnot. And he said, look, I don't read anything that's written about me. And I said, you know what? I need to try that for a minute. So for the people like Julie Beth that got really upset about that, what's the point if you don't read the comments? Well, let me ask you something. Do you ever watch a movie? Do you ever watch Joe Rogan, Jimmy Dore, any of those big names? Well, what's the point if they're not interacting with you? Like I said in that video, I used to interact with the comment section more than anybody else I know. The first few years, I'd spend hours each week trying to explain to the people, especially that disagreed with me, why I see things the way I do. And with dealing with 500 to 1,000 different opinions on each video, it's taxing. But let's just say it's an hour a week for the last five years. That is 260 hours or six and a half full work weeks of interacting with the comment section. So let me ask you, how much time have you spent trying to help others understand why something is right or wrong? It's really easy to type out a five second comment, but it's actually a lot of work to spend six, seven, eight hours on a video and then defend why you said what you said. But, you know, since I had taken a nice little break, I thought I'd make up for lost time and just make a video answering the comments. Most subjects I just see as intellectually entertaining, but when I say what I say about religion, then I do take that seriously because I understand that that's a foundation that some people's worlds are built off of. And like Joshua says here, it, it's good to second guess yourself on things like that. The last thing I want to do is come on here and crush somebody's belief system. But like Benyevsev points out, with the grays behind so much evil, so many lies, this is why I question this too. If anyone's never considered this, they're not challenging themselves. So in part one of this last video, I pointed out why I might be wrong about the Yahweh situation. I'm taking a little intermission from that and answering some of the easier comments that I said I'd get to. And then in the next one on this subject, I'm going to get to why I do think that Yahweh isn't the father of Jesus. And like I said, on this subject, there's some other things out there right now that I want to talk about. And I've only got so many hours in a day. So, okay, sea law. The ark was not made out of solid gold. It was made of acacia wood and overlaid with pure gold. Same thing from William Clark and I think five others. And honestly, I get this kind of thing all the time. <laughs> I'm sure I did say a solid gold arc, but when I was describing the building of the replica, I pointed out that it was made of donated gold and some three tons of Egyptian acacia. I guess I didn't clarify that that was used to build the original arc. What I said was what happened to the other 2.99 tons of acacia wood, implying that it only took 0.01 tons to actually build this arc with. So you'll have to forgive me for not being specific enough there. The top of it and the cherubim are solid gold. The box is acacia wood overlaid in gold. The point that I was meaning to make in that video, but I was having a bad internet day and it's taken forever, was the gold rings that the poles go through that are used to carry this with. They said in the article they were having problems with these gold rings for lifting just the 85 pound replica of it. Pure gold is really heavy, but not very strong. Well, okay, let me clarify. 23.75% pure gold is <laughs> really heavy and not very strong. And here's what they say about the original. Have them make an arc of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet, two rings on one side and two on the other. So you can gold leaf something and not be adding a ton of weight to it. But then it says, make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and then make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. One on one end, one on the other, and make the cherubim of one piece with the cover. So a kilogram gold bar is not very big. And it's not very thick, and that's probably about the minimum size that you could have for something that would support its own weight. The top cover and the cherubim are solid gold. 
one solid piece. They're all to be made together. So I've got a wood storage box that I built that's roughly that size, four foot by two foot by two foot, just made out of some three quarter ply. Scott made a life size replica for his eighth grade religion class. And the point I'm getting to here is this box is pretty damn heavy. And gold is a very soft metal with not very much structural integrity. So if you added a solid gold cover on the top of this with a couple of cherubim statuettes, then how much does all of that weigh? This replica looks like it's about half the size of the original. So in one of the biggest I don't know answers the internet has ever given me, the estimated uh, weight of the Ark was around 183 pounds. However, estimates vary and the Ark's cover alone may have weighed as much as 2,500. 100 pounds depending on how thick the gold was. So my point to all of this is, is this even physically possible? Could they have built an arc of that size out of solid gold and acacia wood and then thrown some gold rings on the side of it and then marched around with it for hundreds and hundreds of miles without it breaking apart? Because, well, I'll stop beating around the bush about it. We're talking about people that aren't exactly known for being truthful to people outside of their little tribe. And I'm wondering how much of the OT is actual historical fact and how much is mythological. Now, I personally think the story of Jesus was so big that they couldn't make it go away, and so they had to co-opt it. And working along with the Church of Rome, they might have taken a story of someone that completely rebelled against their cause put a little spin on it, just like everything we hear today, and then decided that they should just go ahead and slap the Old Testament on the front of the new one. Because, well, the Babylonian holy book expressly says that it is a virtuous thing to lie and con a goy. Another interesting tidbit is that during the Exodus, supposedly hundreds of thousands of people, I don't remember exactly how many, but a ton of people wandered around this desert for 40 years out here and... There's not a trace of it nowadays. Can't find any of the fire pits, can't find anything. Another interesting tidbit here is that the Egyptians were prolific ark builders. They built many different types of arcs. So what are the odds that the true God creator of the universe showed up to this one people and said, you know what, I hate everything about these Egyptians except that box thing that they built. That's what I want. I want you guys to go out in the desert I want you to burn some animals to me and build me a box like that. <laughs> so I'm just asking, is this a true story or not? And is it physically possible to slap some gold rings on the side of this thing and carry it around for hundreds of miles? One thing that's been bouncing around the back of my mind for a couple years now is the story of the walls of Jericho, where they marched around the city seven times with the ark. And then after that, they all blew their trumpets and the walls came crumbling down? Well, is this a mythologized version of past catastrophes? Because I, I'll tell you what, as soon as I saw this picture, I knew that they weren't being allegorical about this. Something flaming through the air makes a sound, and they are being literal about the trumpet sounding. So let me show you a small scale version of this in the name of science. So you hear that sound that just little tiny droplets are making when they're on fire falling through the air. I'm not going to tell you guys how I did that because everybody will be big mad at me. Klamata Chang's all my fault. But yeah, these trumpets have been heard along with the aerial phenomena many, many times before. So when I hear about sounding the trumpet and the walls of Jericho falling down, I'm making a connection there. Now, Geppetto's playlist made a comment about that, that they stomped and blew their horns so that the inhabitants of Jericho wouldn't hear or feel the sappers digging under the walls of their city. Josephus talks about this in the siege of Jerusalem, how the Romans had their siege engines out there, and the sappers started tunneling down, and they tunneled all the way out underneath their siege en engines. They hollowed out a big cavern directly underneath the siege engines with a bunch of wood supports, and then they lit the wood supports on fire, and when it collapsed, then all the siege engines fell down. But I gotta say, I don't believe a whole lot of the self-proclaimed best general in the world, Josephus, 
let's say my house is under siege right now and this tree right here is the siege engine. Well, if I go out there with a measuring tape or I guess at that time a measuring stick and measure off exactly how far that tree is away, I'm going to get caught up by the enemy. Now, a siege engine is going to be out there probably a couple hundred yards, but you really have no way of going out there and measuring exactly how many yards it is away. So to just take off and dead reckon your way to that siege engine and be directly underneath it would be quite the feat. And that's if they left it in exactly the same place long enough for you to do that. I hear people on YouTube all the time saying there's no way that they could have dug out all of these ancient tunnels. But now we're saying that they could make it a couple hundred yards in a matter of days, apparently, and then wind up dead on directly underneath it so that they could collapse the siege engine down into a pit. So it, it's definitely an interesting thought, but I am still thinking that there may have been some ancient cataclysm going on and they took credit for it. That'd be a lot of tunneling. Homebody Heaven says Yahweh didn't make the Yeezys die in the wilderness. The old ones just died. Well, about that. That was in response to me saying that Yahweh said that everybody over 20 years old, you're going to die out in this wilderness. And more of the reason why I say Yahweh was a petty evil tyrant. He had promised them the promised land, and then when they get there, it was full of giants. And they said they were swallowed up by the land. All the vegetation, everything was huge. They felt like grasshoppers in their eyes. The scouts had spent 40 days out scouting, and they came back and told the rest of the camp what they had seen, and then everybody started getting scared and trepidatious about it. So Yahweh, in all his love and forgiveness, says for 40 years, one year for each day of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and you will know what it is like to have me against you. And honestly, when I read Yahweh talking like this, I kind of picture the bad guy from Aladdin in my mind. Just he can't believe he's having to deal with people, you know, so below him. And he says, well, OK, yes, I have forgiven them. As you have asked, nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt, and not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. The Lord, me in the third person, abounding in love and forgiveness, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So if you mess up, I'm taking it out on your kids, your grandkids, and your great grandkids. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you 20 years old or more who is counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I have swore with uplifted hand to make your home. Except Caleb and Joshua, they're still cool. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in this wilderness. So, to Homebody's Heaven, I think I was pretty accurate when I said Yahweh condemned everybody over 20 to die in the wilderness. And back to Julie Beth, that's what I spend a lot of times clarifying when I do answer comments. Only if I go down too far past like the top 50 comments, then it's where the name calling starts. And people start in with no dummy, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> So if you want to judge me for taking a break from all of that, then I invite you to get on this side of the microphone, start your own channel, and you interact with 500 people a day like that. Because really, I'm just a guy sitting here in my dining room in a really dusty house that, thank God, I'm about to finally get done with all the drywall because it's taken six months because I can only work on my house a week here and a week there. So hopefully I can at least have a clean house for once but honestly most of the time it feels like i'm sitting here talking to a wall and it's still kind of surreal that other people actually listen to this <laughs> it is really cool that ethel dreda is enjoying this from england 
And I really do appreciate all of the positive comments, but I'll tell you, when I'm already so depressed I can barely force myself to get on here and talk, then I'm going to be a little bit guarded about subjecting myself to the negative ones. But let's end off on a high note here, because I actually thought it'd be kind of a cool thing to actually make videos answering the comments. But no good deed goes unpunished in this world. Soviet Union defector, I can't say that name out loud, but it is kind of crazy, the story of the Passover and the offing of the firstborn sons of Egypt, and the Lord sent his angel, and they were to mark all of the doors with lamb's blood, it has a striking resemblance to what Procopius wrote about in the 500 AD cycle, where they described these supernatural entities going door to door literally knocking on doors and spreading the plague. And then you hear about these same dark figures in the 1300s around the time of the Black D. So you might be onto something there. Awake not woke. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how they've convinced everybody that Jacob was the good guy in that situation. And how Yahweh chose him to be the patriarch of a great nation to come that here we are a couple thousand years later. Is it, is it come yet? Because it sounds like Yahweh keeps reneging on that, just like he reneged on giving the promised land to the people that he led out of Exodus that we just talked about that he punished and made them wander in the wilderness till their bones filled the wilderness. But we'll be talking about Jacob in the upcoming Why I Think Yahweh is Bad video. Rich Monk, same thing. Yeah, we're going to get into all that soon. Dan the Man might be missing mi radioactive materials inside. Talking about the Ark. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's. I see it as something close to radioactive. I don't think it's actually radioactive, but it is some kind of power. Yahweh literally glowed with this power. I mean, Moses was still glowing when he came down from the mountain, and it's a lot like Lucifer, the morning star. So are we talking about the same entity here? Possibly. Jean Roche Dion, probably pronouncing that wrong. It's a capacitor. Yeah, I think it was full of energy, and I know it was used as a communication device. And I've heard it theorized that it was a weapon as well. I'll have to look into the Hutchinson effect. So that's enough out of me. It's just kind of par for the course for the way things are going in my life right now that I could take something that I thought was going to be cool for everybody and then get people all butthurt about it. <laughs> so I hope you can forgive me for only donating six and a half <laughs> work weeks of my time answering comments on here. And then since I had slacked off on that some, eh, making videos about them. So I'll just try to keep my problems to myself next time. Static out.